Throughout the centuries, philosophers from all walks of life have tried to define morality in a myriad of incompatible ways. The Greeks, for instance, defined it in terms of virtue. English philosopher John Stuart Mill defined it in terms of good consequences. Immanuel Kant explained it in terms of universal maxims, and the list goes on and on and on. But underlying many of these conceptions, there has always been an implicit dichotomy, an assumption that there is the everyday world of material things over here, and up there is the cloudy realm of morality, filled with nebulous terms that we cannot touch, access, or perceive. The naturalist comes along and denies this distinction categorically. His reasoning can really be explained in a threefold process. He first begins by observing the fact that as humans, we have collectively attained a dominion of the world around us through the scientific enterprise. Spooky, supernatural stuff like ghosts, spirits, and all other things that have been believed throughout the ages have thus far not been found to exist. The only things that there are are natural entities and phenomena that we can explore empirically through science. There is nothing else in the world but natural properties. The second step in his reasoning is that which incorporates morality into this naturalistic worldview. He considers that since everything that we come into contact with essentially boils down to particles of matter like atoms and electrons, anything that exists must be explainable in terms of these. All that talk about good, justice, right and wrong must by necessity emerge from these bare natural properties in physical reality. And thirdly and finally, Considering the two previous premises, the naturalist concludes that it must be the case that if there are such things as moral properties, they are synonymous with natural properties. A great deal of the attractiveness and convincing power of moral naturalism is that it allows us to claim that our moral judgments are real in the most tangible sense. If one adopts moral naturalism, one can safely assert that correct ethical judgments are not opinions, but are rather facts akin to the laws of motion. The naturalist essentially pins down some tangible, empirically identifiable natural property, like pleasure or happiness, for instance, and equates this with moral goodness. Thus, if you wanted to know if helping the needy is good, you need only look at the amount of happiness that this action produces, and this will serve as a proxy metric for its moral value. You could technically measure happiness through a variety of methods. You could measure the levels of certain neurochemicals related to happiness in people's brains, or appeal to self-reported surveys asking people how they feel on a scale of 1 to 5 among various others. The point being that the previously unquantifiable, useless abstractions of goodness and rightness can now be grounded on something observable and scrutable. Whether or not naturalism in fact succeeds in making its case is a matter of considerable debate. There have been substantial objections to this metaethical theory that have arguably not been appropriately dealt with. In the next episode, we will examine one of the most famous objections to the theory, G. E. Moore's open question argument. In the meantime, thanks for watching, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and see you next time.